All righty, we're going to start our study session for the new year, our first one for 2019. Yay. So with, um, I have item number eight, and I'm going to call that one ready. Councillor Thompson. Yes, Madam President. I have uh, items nine through 12. Uh, we have the fire chief here to explain some of these. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Mons. I'm the fire chief. Um, chief, I know that there were a couple of questions about uh, the uh, how, how long the uh, fire uh, engines, how long they last, how many years we put on them, miles, and uh, what the what the state is now, so that they can. Okay. Well, our state of our apparatus fleet for the particular engines that we're trying to buy, um, it's kind of in a dire need right now. Uh, our, I have my maintenance guys here who oversee that division. Um, some nights they go home at night and we're not sure if we have a spare uh, one of our frontline engines go down. So the typical lifespan um, that we try to maintain is 10 years for a frontline and 15 years for a backup um, fire engine. Um, these particular engines that um, I'm requesting to buy each engine we're saving two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a piece because our maintenance division they worked out a deal with the manufacturer so we're saving seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on these three on these three uh, particular engines also we applied for a grant which i came to you guys um late last year that particular engine cost seven hundred and eighty thousand dollars uh we'd get reimbursed seven hundred and two thousand dollars of that money if it's approved if we get the grant so is there any other questions What's the age of the apparatuses that you're replacing? Um, I have a, I have a bunch. There, there, we have a, a lot of different things going on with our apparatus, and if you want, I can go down some of the some of the issues we have with them. If you have, the, if or you want. chief minds, if you can, because I don't know. I think I requested that you For send the fleet. us over okay. the fleet. And yep. let us see the ages of the okay. vehicles. I, but I got my guys from maintenance here. They can come up and ask, answer some specific questions, uh, Councillor Ryan. If you want. Yes, yeah, so. spe specifically just the ages of the uh, the ones that are going to be replaced too at this moment. So, um, this is uh, Zach Smith. He's a district chief. He works over in our maintenance <laughs> maintenance division. Um, these guys have a great handle on what we're doing with our apparatus. Good afternoon. So I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you in the back. What was the, the specific question you guys were looking The for? age of the apparatus. The age. So it's a fleet. Um, the oldest vehicle we're running right now is a 2002 La France. The, these are the ones that we're going to bond for. Which ones are we going to bond for is what the, what the, the question is. Three engines. Yes. Three, three and, engines. and what are the ones and, and what are the, the ages the that we're, we're replacing? Replace. Yes. Uh, would be an 02, 02s and an 06. Okay. We, we were kind of in a hole in regards to our apparatus and uh, we're digging ourselves out. We had problems with the trucks a few years ago. We we're okay there. We got we to gotta address that in the next couple of years, but not now. Right now, we have to dig ourselves out of the hole in regards to the, uh, engines. the engines. We have three American Liver Francis. They don't make them anymore. They're out of business. Uh, and the other question, uh, in real, as far as the age and stuff like that, we run all the numbers. When we start getting up to around 13, 14 years, the money we got to put into these keep them running is just, I don't want to say it's throwing away money, but it's kind of like, eh, it's time to retire these things. So I, I guess my, my question um, would be in regards to when we're replacing them. I mean, the ones that we're getting rid of, the, are we going to keep these for pieces to be able to use and take from because you mentioned yeah it's yeah, yeah. We, 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 we scavenge them we, we go through and we take everything off and it's just a skeleton that for okay. a while and then we just it goes to the scrapyard so these are just going to be backups that we're going to store and hopefully no no there's some of them are close to being dead being condemned either okay. because of frame reasons or whatever but we will go through and take off parts that we think we might be able to use okay and, and our existing fleet realistically we should be okay for like a year or so before it gets into dire straits again or is this I mean, or should we, we be need looking? these three pumpers yes. and then w it'll be addressed about trucks two years down the road uh, you know it's just again when we get to that 10-year mark the the repair expenses start to escalate yeah. and then 15 and we we implemented a lot of things our big <laughs> big problem is corrosion so we've done a lot of things in the past two years to hopefully buy us more time two or three more years so we don't have to condemn it at 15 maybe we can keep it 18 
And when you scrap that, do we get any money for those for yeah. the scrap? Yeah. We do. It goes right to, it, the check comes to me and then it goes to, uh, yeah, okay. I send it to our fiscal officer, Diane. So the uh, apparatuses that we're addressing, when do we expect um, we will need to readdress apparatuses in the future? How long do we think we're going to okay. have? Yeah, starting a few years ago, we were problems with the truck. We addressed that. We're okay for now. Or we had a problem with uh, minis. We addressed that. We're okay now. Now we're addressing the engines. If we get these three engines, we're good for a couple more years, but then we have to address the septic trucks. I guess my question is, like, do we have an idea of what the cycle is for when we think we're addressing that again? We, we do two, two engines, a truck, two engines, a truck, and every fifth year we do a specialty vehicle. So it could be a ladder truck or it could be a heavy rescue. Okay. So we kind of take a break from the engines and the trucks, and then there even could be a year in there where it's like, you know, the smaller vehicles that we need, uh, okay, we're, we're short on this, this, or that. We'll, we'll plug those in. It could be an ambulance. It could be whatever. Because we just did a ladder not too long yeah. ago. Yeah, and that, that, that won't see a lot of, it, that's a very important piece of equipment we haven't had in years and years, especially with the redevelopment of downtown and Inner Harbor and stuff like that. Um, it's not going to be pounding on the streets every day. It's not going to take a beating as, as the other ones that go out on just whatever type calls. So, you know, the last one we got 20 years out of it. So I'm hoping that if you send us over the list, it'll give us a little comprehensive that we can look at them because you've already said that they're 10 to 15 years life cycle so once we get the list we can look at the yeah. age of the vehicles and the mileage actually to be free it's not miles uh, you know just these are diesels just it's, the, it's the hours just hours the on the motor okay so if you're sitting there pumping on north Carolina street for eight hours that takes a lot of wear and tear on that motor okay we'll just send us over the year okay we'll do we'll do all we'll give you miles and, and hours but hours are important all righty thank you when, when we do this just one real quick. When we do these purchases, these four, there's four engines that we're getting. Well, there's a grant that we may or may not get. No, no, no. I, I understand. That. I just okay. think we're getting four. Are, are they brand new vehicles? Do they have any wear and tear on them? Are these straight right, from the, the one? The grant will be brand new, right from the manufacturer. Okay. The other three are. I don't want to use the word refurbished. Right. Um, if you can picture what a, a fire <laughs> engine looks like, it has a lot of hoses and stuff like that. It has a big metal boom on the front. It's 50 foot. And those are very, very expensive. Um, those are being rehabbed by the manufacturer, the one who originally built it in the first place. What's the cost for a boom uh, as an option? Uh, roughly $200,000. A lot of money. Okay. We're also repurposing the pumps. So we do pump tests every year on all our vehicles that have a pump. And so these three pumpers that we dedicated to be rehabbed, and these are just the two parts. Mm -hmm. uh, one needs to be rebuilt. It's about 15 grand. It's done locally. The other two are fine. We have all this equipment to test it. <coughs> is it in with specs? And we know, can we get another 10, 15 years out of this? Okay. Uh, but keep in mind that everything else is brand new. The chassis is brand new. The cab's brand new. You know, the motor's brand new. Everything's brand new. It's just the two very expensive parts on a fire engine are that boom and that pump. And those are being rebuilt. And they, you won't know the difference. When we take delivery of it, you will not know the so difference. We're looking look at it and go, another, that's gorgeous. So we're looking to get another 10 to 15 years yes. on the rehab vehicles yes. as well. Yes. And, and we're doing this because, you know, if we came to you and said we need X amount of dollars for three brand new ones, you could just go, that's a lot of money. Well, we did our homework. We're working with the, the manufacturers and everything else. How can we get that price down where we can get it free? <coughs> so you're happy and we're happy. Yes, uh, 12 is 12 is up. Uh, 12 is a little different. Um, number 12, the, am the ambulance portion. Thank you, okay. Chiefs. So we're looking to re um, replace one of our ambulances. Uh, the, the newest ambulance we have is a 2013. Our backup is a 2004. So we're looking to replace our older one. So I, my question um, with the ambulance is, um, really if we should do it uh, is this a business we want to be in um, is the running of this ambulance necessary um, do we seem to uh, yep. I, know, I know last year uh, we, we had a conversation. yeah we had a conversation and you had some valid points and I asked some of those same questions when I started last year so um, when you're looking at the ambulance as a as one of our services we provide to our constituents right now um, that ambulance provides a service that um, the year before 
I think we went on 203 transports. So when our private ambulance companies are either understaffed or they're too busy, then we are relied on to go transport. So I think that's, you know, when you're looking at changing something that um, hasn't been working the best, probably not um, all the way, but it has been um, a big part of our public safety initiative. And so when we're going to look at changing a, a, a policy or procedure, I want to make sure we don't negatively impact public safety. So we've been doing our homework all year long, looking at different cities, what they do, looking at um, different things we can do with this ambulance, and at the same time not jeopardizing any public safety. So I have some um, things that I'm going to bring forward in a couple of weeks. I've been in uh, contact with a uh, chairman um, of the Public Safety Committee, uh, Councilor Thompson, and we're just trying to get everything together because when you're making a decision to not run an ambulance, uh, I want to make sure that it's the right decision because we've been doing it for so long and it saved um, countless lives and you know it, it, it responds and, it, and, it, and it's a service that we provide to the city right now and to remove that I think we really have to do our homework which we've been doing so well and I appreciate that um, okay. when you get a better grip on this um, I'd be interested in um, if there's any information on if uh, it seems like the private companies uh, maybe cherry picking and we get certain a very specific certain group of calls um, and also the idea of what it does to station three and if it leaves station three understaffed and and uh, maybe a portion of the city underserved so or, you know in a position of not being safe so um, I'll touch oh. up with you but okay all right that's a couple concerns of mine. is there any more questions or okay uh, those are my items they'll be ready yep. all right, thank you thank you Councilor. Thank you, Madam President. I have items 13 through 15. How are you doing? Good afternoon, Councilors. My name is Adria Finch. I'm the Director of Innovation here at the City. So items 13 through 15 are all connected. Uh, over the summer, I came to you and asked for permission to apply for better? Okay. Asked to apply to the Startup in Residence program. This is a program in which the whole idea is cities have more problems than they actually have the ability to solve, so can we get some external help to solve them? And so as part of this, we identify a handful of challenges that we then ask startup companies to help us solve and develop tech-based solutions for. So we put out an RFP for five different challenges, and we'd like to move forward with uh, three of those with the companies listed here. So um, item 13 is with um, a company called Adam Peruta Design Company. They're a local company, and they will be helping to develop a tech-based tech -based solution um, in partnership with the Trauma Response Team and Timothy Jennings Bay um, to uh, help increase grassroots efforts to curb violence in the community, specifically gun violence. <coughs> Item 14 is with uh, this company out of the Bay Area called Camino, who will help to develop a solution to improve the permitting process here in the city. And item 15 is with Vite Labs, who is um, another startup out of the Bay Area that will help to uh, develop a crowdfunding platform for uh, people, low income people struggling um, to make housing related financial transactions. Uh, any questions Are from the company? Um, the way that the program works is that we work with the companies on a no-cost basis uh, for a period of four months and which they develop the solution and then if they produce a solution that we like we would pay for it um, but there is no these are startup companies so really the solutions haven't been developed yet um, I shouldn't I should say with the exception of the Adam Pru design this is actually based off a technology that has been launched um, on some college campuses and it's being tailored for a municipal purpose. So if you were to, to so if you were to want to move forward after four months, uh, would the agreement that we're voting on now give you permission to move forward or would you have to come back to the council for approval? We did an RFP so it should allow us to move forward. How much was the grant for? Um, it, we, we're actually not, it's a no cost, so we're not getting money, we're, get, we're a part of the program um, and we're working with the companies for no cost, but we're not receiving any money. And so after the four months, mm -hmm. where would the money come from? That would, they would need to come from budget lines within the city or, uh, for example, um, the one with, um, that we're working with with Noble. Um, we'll be working with community members to try to identify funding for that if possible. Okay. 
but you and we're starting those conversations. Of how much it would actually cost? Uh, we do not at this point in time. We at, at the start of this, what we did do is try to identify uh, funding that we thought we would be able to put forward towards this. Um, but again, since it's a technology that isn't officially developed yet, we're not sure exactly what the cost will be. Um, but that is part of, in evaluating these companies um, in the spring or summer when we decide if we move forward, we're going to make sure it's a financially feasible option before we would. Well, I think after the four months, you would have to come back before this body anyway, so. Right. So Catherine said that the language in it says after four weeks, so they would have to come back. Yeah. Okay. After 400 hours. Yeah. Have you heard of other cities who have used this four-month trial period with startups to come up with solutions? Yes. So this is actually a startup um, with uh, out of the mayor's office of innovation in San Francisco. Uh, we actually first learned about it because the city of Durham was doing a similar program. And they said, "Oh, you need to go talk to Pittsburgh." We learned from them, and Pittsburgh said, "Hey, you need to talk to San Francisco." So we're actually part of a cohort of 32 local governments throughout the United States and Canada that are part of this program this year. Great. So for the for the grassroots effort with with Noble, with the, uh, what is that, do we know what that looks like roughly? Or I'm, I'm just confused as to what increasing how, grassroots how it will. Yeah. efforts um, looks so like. So actually this one's kind of interesting. It started out as a platform where he came to our team in the fall and said he wanted some type of platform to help notify the public when there had been a traumatic event and help connect them to counseling um, resources. Um, and unfortunately our team just didn't have the capacity or actually the skill set no offense, Sam, um, to build an application um, <laughs> for, for him. And so we thought it would be a good opportunity to use this program as a platform. Um, when we received the RFPs or the responses back, we had um, three companies who actually did just that. They alerted people to when something happened. But this company that we selected, they went a little bit farther. So they actually have, um, it's a ways that you can earn points um, and so it almost becomes a competition to do community events. And those community events could be like attend an ice cream social with the police chief. Um, he's not here, so I feel like I can, you know, um, put that on his um, right calendar. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, or, um, you know, attend an event at a school or be part of a community cleanup. Um, and so it, it gets out of, it, in addition to the notification. So it still does the notification, but then it tries to engage people in the community in a new way. It's an app, isn't it? Isn't an app? We think it will be an app, yes. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. No further questions? I'll call those items ready. You have, hold on, yeah, hold on. Hold on one Adrian. second. You said you mentioned that there were uh, five challenges, uh, but you only picked three. What yep. were the other two? I'm just curious. Um, one was uh, a little ambitious. We were looking for autonomous sidewalk snow plows. Nobody responded to that one. Um, and the other challenge that we were looking at <laughs> was. Um, <laughs> to help with data collection uh, with trash pickup and yard and waste pickup. And we did receive proposals or responses back for those. Um, most of them, they just didn't meet the need that we have or the one that did, um, they gave an estimate for costs and it was going to be about $100,000 a year and we couldn't afford that. And so we said, sorry, we can't right. work with anybody. So we passed on that one altogether. Thank you. All right. Thanks, That's Andrew. one of my items. All righty. Councillor Rudd. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. I have items 16 and 17. But first, I just want to wish everybody a happy new year, especially, I guess, the sophomore class of the council. So the cohort that now has one year under our belt, Councillor Green, Councillor Driscoll, Councillor Allen, and me. And then for all the questions that we've asked the over council. the last year, uh, we'll still have more questions, but and thanks to the vets for uh, schooling us. But I look forward to a year with a year under our belt. So. Councillor Green's in that group. Yeah. I said Councillor Green. Oh, yeah. He needs a couple of weeks to have the one year, but yeah. <laughs> I, I included him. Dave, would you like to introduce your item? Good afternoon, continuing with the good cheer. Happy New Year, everybody. I'm Dave Proek, Director of IT. And I'm here to urge your support for item number 16. As you know, we went live in 2018 with the broadcast and the taping of Common Council meetings. Um, the technical solution that was put in place there, we knew it wasn't a permanent solution. It got us out of the gate. We've had, knock on wood, no hiccups so far. But the, we're ready to move forward on the more permanent solution. 
currently whenever we broadcast or tape something, we have to have WCNY staff on site here. And they're actually operating out of a closet down the hall here. Yes, you've seen them. You've seen them. Yeah. Good thing OSHA's not here, right? So, um, so we're ready for the more permanent solution, and that will be a fiber connection between City Hall and WCNY. So we're asking for permission to enter into a contract with Northland Communications for a, um, a monthly cost of $550. Contract has a three-year term. And uh, the, the folks from D WCNY have been, <clears throat> excuse me, very good partners. In their contract, they have the ability to charge us a $75 an hour rate. As of late, uh, so far in the contract period, they have not done this. They're operating in good faith. But as you might imagine, as we roll out expanded use of this, if you constantly have to have these people ushered down here, if they have to find parking, blah, blah, blah. So we're asking you to support item number 16 so we can enter into this contract in Northland and uh, create this uh, fiber connection and we'll no longer need this manual effort for this, uh, for the broadcast of these What's that? that rates so the set them free. There you go, there you go, set so, them free. So that $75 an hour uh, contract that they could exercise if they want currently, will that number be readjusted? They're, they're, they won't need to be on site. That was only when they need to be, be on site. they doing work. Yeah, that, that we have a contract in place. We pay them for their services to make this, uh, television ready and we put it on YouTube so that's that doesn't change the $75 an hour charge was was above and beyond when they were here so they'll continue to cover are they covering all activities in the chambers um, there's a there is a ceiling on the number of hours um, I don't I don't have that in per front of me now. per year or per month or it has to do with like the number of sessions and it counts yeah. for a half hour and it ha comes in half hour slots it was all in the original thing and it was based on the number of sessions we have in a year so in theory we should have enough and it should be I guess I'm also concerned about um, you know the zoning meeting and the preservation committee. right so it's based that was taken into consideration when they made the estimate I do think it's something to keep an eye on sure and we're coming up on the one-year anniversary it'll be a good time to take a look at how many hours did we actually use it what do we budget for and then we right. get back to you and say listen we have the capacity in the current budget to f expand it by 30 hours how do you guys want to spend that time or whatever you see fit it's just my concern is that we go over have the resources to make sure we're doing it and doing it right so this is going to be remote they're going to remotely do this yeah they'll be able to do it all from their from their their engineering headquarters there on Fayette Street yeah. I mean, right, right now they run they run the PBS stations everywhere from San Francisco and Hawaii and Philadelphia so <laughs> so this is a this is a slam dunk for them so the budget for fiscal year 19 for streaming is 63,000 so this is just staying the same it's not an increase is it an increase to that budget or the, the payment for this for so this it's a new service it's a, the new yeah, service yeah. that's coming that, that's coming out of my budget the payment we provide to WCNY for what the, the engineering they do I believe that's out of Common Council's budget no, no. but this isn't touching that that okay. contract this isn't touching this is the not the contract though no. this is just an no. agreement to expand the so covers right. yep right. yep yep exactly Up till now, they have. Based on the fact that we would in good faith get this done, this. absolutely. Right. All right. Okay. But you are internally shifting resource, like six thousand worth of resources within your budget. Yeah, I, I have the I have the budget for this. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, counselors. Thank you. Okay. Item seventeen. Sam. Good afternoon, counselors. Happy What's New Year. Your pitch. <laughs> so um, this is uh, to enter into agreement with the Center for Government Excellence at Johns Hopkins University. This is a part of uh, the What Works Cities initiative that we've been working with Bloomberg Philanthropies on over the last few years. The idea is that they would come in and help us to work through a advanced analytics project from start to finish. So the identification of a problem, collection of data, building a model and then implementing it. Um, it's purposely broad. We haven't figured out exactly what the, um, what the project is, partly because that's part of what we want to learn and sort of how to, how to implement. So part of that will be going around and, and identifying the priorities and, and where we think that there's most uh, opportunity to do the project and then um, going forward and, and, uh, and doing the project. So your tie looks great. <laughs> I'll tell my wife she got it for me um, for the holidays. But I do want to push back a little bit. <laughs> Go ahead, Councilor Red. Because there have been this broad, intentionally broad, it 
kind of makes me nervous, and it's been a critique that I've had in the past. And I, you have, we have this appendix <coughs> scope of work, which is helpful, but it has, in my opinion, a lot of like consultant gobbledygook kind of language. Mm -hmm. and it's very not sticky. And uh, there's the objective, there's five objectives, which have things like increased internal access and use of data, conduct analysis designed to generate insights. And I would much, it does, the goal, it does say to progress on priority issues. I would like a couple edits to this scope. Okay. I would like where it says priority issues and doesn't define them to define them, which okay. as the link you sent me there, achieve fiscal sustainability, um, increase economic investment in neighborhoods, quali quality engagement for c citizens, and uh, like efficient, effective, Delivery equitable of services. delivery of services. So in, I think the first one is first for a reason, you achieve fiscal sustainability. And I've always thought the I team and any other name it goes by should prioritize saving money and increasing revenue. So I would like the objectives to say, so you can list those priorities in the goal. And then in the objectives, I would like two to be save the city money and generate more money it could be as simple as instead of saying generate insights, it could say generate cost efficiencies. But I think it needs to be written. I think the, like, that to me still seems broad and empowering, but given that the number one priority is achieve fiscal sustainability, I think the objectives have to say save money or bring in new money. Okay. So if we can make that adjustment, then I'm cool with it. And if not, then I think we should have a committee meeting next week to talk about why we can't incorporate save money and... Uh, reduce and generate new money. That sounds reasonable. I'll go back to them. So I, I guess my question is the, the cost to us. At, at this point, it's just... It's just staff hours. time. Yeah, staff yep. time. Okay. Yeah, the, the, Until they come up with some sort of solution that may end up, you know, needing to be or wanted to be implemented, correct? Well, basically, we would be trained on how to develop all of that, and then it would continue to be staff time. Now, if there was something that said we would change the way that we do a certain thing, then there may be some operational change that would cost something. But I, I don't, it, to Councilor Rudd's point, the hope would be that we can do things more efficiently. Okay. And I, I, I guess that's sort of, I mean, are we really just the goal of this to try and better collect data? Or is it to... To better understand it, I think, okay. to, to just do our operations more more efficiently, more effectively. Um, and and so it, that's part of the, the idea through the whole partnership with mm -hmm. Warwick Cities and, and uh, Center for Government Excellence being a part of that. Um, so there's there's no cost. This has all been a technical assistance uh, an agreement between us for the last couple of years. Okay. Any other um, questions? My only other reiterating comment is I think similar to other processes like the financial restructuring board where we tried to be proactive and specific so that we get the help we want. Mm -hmm. I think this is a case where we benefit by being more specific. I understand there's going to be a process for which they look at our data and we don't want to constrain them. But at the same time, I don't think understanding that doesn't save us money and doesn't bring in new money helps. So like, I just want I can, people who are looking at it to I can make sure that, that gets explicitly put in there. know that. Otherwise, the shoe's also very clean to start the year. Lovely. Thanks. It's always I'm happy cool. that we're on TV for this. If you're a good person. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks. Uh, All set. Councillor Green. Thank you, Madam President. Start with item 18. Hi, Ann Fordak from DPW. Did you have any questions about 18 or you just wanted me to yeah, you want, I saw the letter. Do you want to just kind of briefly explain where we're sharing? And so um, this came out of an employee suggestion that, um, you know, we, where the GPW is located, that we could use something on the other side of town to get our vehicles back out on the road faster. So if we had a place where we could get salt and get that vehicle loaded and back out, we could clean roads faster and hit more areas because not as much time would be wasted on the highway. And so I took that suggestion and ran with it. <laughs> and I found that New York State had a salt barn and that they were willing to work with us. So we're going to try. We're going to try something new, see if it helps. And um, the dollar number you see in there is just a value. There's actually not going to be any money exchanged. This for the purpose of the agreement. You need to, to kind of fill in a dollar amount. 
but it's if it works, it's a win-win, and if it doesn't work, we tried something new, and we'll learn from it. So. This one is in Van Rensselaer. Off Van Rensselaer, this is like not very used uh, salt barn that the uh, New York State has. It's just there for emergencies. Once we get theirs out, and if it gets down, we will replenish it. Yes. Yep. The way the trucks don't have to go all the way from the west side back to east and then come back down to the west side. Exactly. Makes sense. It makes sense. I thought it was a great idea, so we thought we'd try it out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Item 19. Good afternoon. I'm Pat Mohn, and I'm with the City of Syracuse um, Parking Garage Supervisor. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Hayward, Fryer, and Kuhn are proposing an agreement with us for parking spaces in the Fayette garage. We have the space and the capacity for that, and that's why the agreement's in front of you. Is this new or? This is a new agreement. The actual agreement's with Baruch Place, that owns one park place, but Hayward, Fryer, and Kuhn are uh, tenants, or soon to be tenants. What's the market rate right now? Market rate there is $100. It says, uh, you know, a minimum of 45, maximum of 120. Do we have like a ballpark idea of what they well, actually want to use? Or? What they've told us is that they're intending on May 1st to have 45 spaces, needing 45 spaces, and then sometime during the summer it should, we should get to a, a, an equilibrium, but it won't exceed 120 for sure. We don't believe well, it will. We're probably gonna want it. I think it'll probably be closer to 100, I believe, but. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item 20. 20, 21. All yeah. Three. Yeah. They're all the same. Good afternoon. Happy New Year. I'm Joe Awell, Commissioner of Water. Items 20, 21, and 22 all deal with the Morningside Reservoir roof replacement. Uh, we're requesting project authorization and sale and purchase of bonds in the amount of $3.5 million to replace the centered roof that collapsed at the reservoir last March. Did you explore any grants option or? So part of this process is we got to get uh, the grant funding. Uh, state agencies like to see construction plans. So we've done the investigation report and we're going to proceed with construction plans to get the grants potentially to. Do we have an idea if we think that it will be getting some funds? It all depends on what grant programs are open. Yep. yep. Typically, the grant deadlines are April or May, so we're trying to get a jump on this. So when those uh, programs are open, we can apply for them as soon as we are everything's you available. With any of the other programs in the past, are these programs that fund some ten, fifty, all of it? Are there any so, history on some of these programs? Like how much they yeah. fund? Typically, it's fifty to sixty percent of the project costs. Um, sometimes there are different. Up, uh, grants out there that may do more, but typically it's around 60% of the total project cost. Thank you. Any other questions? That's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, and, and Councilor Kearney, before you jump on, I want to ask Ann a question real quick mm -hmm. because I want to ask the same question of you that we've asked of fire. Could you send us over a list of your vehicles? And the ones because I think I saw one of your trucks on fire this past week over there on Solar Street, and I need we need to have an update on your on the vehicle. So just list of vehicles and the, um, the age of them, okay. and all of that because we make model we yep. into budget, okay. so we need to have these. Things. Okay, no problem. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, it was on fire too. Um, Councilor right. Carney, <laughs> thank you, Madam President. I have. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Items uh, 23, 24, and 25. Good afternoon. Julie LaFave, Commissioner of Parks and Recreation. Um, item number 23, we are actually withdrawing. Okay. So it, it, it will not be put back on. No. Okay. And item number 24 and 25 are to enter into agreement for services um, related to our recreation programming. Any other questions or any questions at all? Which facilities? 
Um, tennis is outdoor, so that is spring, summer. Well, this would just cover this fiscal year, so um, I, will, I will get you an exact location on that one, but I believe it's outside. Fight for Hearts is at Magnarelli Center. Is where? At the Magnarelli, McChesney. <clears throat> For the fight for hearts? No, for the tennis out there. Um, it may be indoors. I'm sorry, I don't have that right now. I know because primarily I know we do it in the summertime, but they may have some kind of clinic that's indoors that they don't need a full tennis court. So I can get that for you by Monday. Thank you. I have a question. It's unrelated to these items, but uh, I know in the summertime, you guys, when do you normally start your application process? For, for employees? Yeah. Uh, always on kind of a rolling basis, really. No, like the summer, the youth program, summer youth programs, when do you normally start it? Isn't it like in April or May when you start taking the applications? When we start accepting applications for summer employment? Yes. We'll start taking them at any point in time, and then they'll start conducting interviews April or May. Okay. Is there any way that we can kind of uh, make a push now for the lifeguard positions so that way we, we won't are, be we, in the same situation? We actually did a video. Which we get a lot of feedback on. We did a video. We're doing a push right now because we real, once March hits, or it's way too late. Right. We still will accept them, and we still can get some training for most of them. But I agree with you. We've already started the push right now. Okay. We had a class that's starting this week, I believe. So okay. we did a push about two weeks ago. Okay. And if you have information that you would like us for, to get out, yeah. just send it to us. Okay. We will. We would love that help. All right. Thank, thank you. you. And a quick question for you: How many of our, our facilities have senior centers? Currently, two but we're looking to see how we can expand that. Um, we just hired a new senior citizen coordinator, so with her assistance, we're looking to see how we can expand it because we have so many facilities that are unused during the day when seniors could be out, so we're looking at it. But currently, right now, it's only the Magnarelli Center and Cecil. Okay, because are we doing like some of these with Fight for Hearts programs at that center, the Cecil Center? We are not right now because they don't have, they need a, a big space like the gym, and Cecil doesn't have a gym. And I appreciate that because the West Side Senior Center was closed during the last administration and they're underserved. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> Councillor Boyle. I'll, I'll take Councillor Boyle's. Uh, it's number 26. It's uh, an agreement with, uh, I believe, the crossing guards. Um, That's the last one. Hello. I'm Donna Briscoe, Assistant Director of Personnel. I have Amanda. Assistant Corporation Counsel Amanda Harrington. Um, crossing guards, it's a 2% uh, for three years. 2%, 2%, 2%. Um, and there will be a change in the <coughs> uniform allowance in 2020 okay. from 180 to $200. And this is the last contract, I believe, correct? The, this is the latest contract, right? I, I'm not. No with the units, yeah. with the bargaining units. Yes. All right. Great. All right. Okay. Thank That's you. right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Allen. Thank you. I have items 27 through 48. Good afternoon, Councillors. Happy New Year. Heather Lamandola, Zoning Administrator. Uh, items 27 is a petition from the Landmark Preservation Board to the Planning Commission to uh, designate uh, 1007 Madison Street as a protected site and the Commission is forwarding their recommendation to this body. It's a Ward Wellington Ward um, house on the corner of Madison. This is currently vacant. No, I believe it's, I believe it is occupied. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, can you explain the process of how this one came up, um, how it ended up on the, you know, on the block right now? Uh, the property owner applied for a demolition permit and that automatically triggers a review by the Preservation Board to determine if it should be designated or not because it is eligible for the National Register um, because it has been identified by the City of Syracuse and it was uh, designed by Ward Wellington Ward who is one of our renowned architects here in the city. Okay, as uh, I, I went to look at the property, um, how to say this, 
Um, why, why do we feel this one particularly needs to be saved? I don't know if that's you or... Mm -hmm. uh, Kate can speak directly to that, but it did meet four, <coughs> the Preservation Board determined that it met four of the criteria uh, established by the Secretary of Interior Standards for designation. I don't know if you want to speak yeah, more you, to can, that. Could I hear more about it, Kate? Is that okay? Good afternoon, Councillors. Uh, Kate Awater, I'm the Preservation Planner for the City. Um, so the house was constructed in 1911. Uh, it was for a local attorney, Herbert Walker. Um, he lived in the house uh, in that house until about the 1940s. Um, it was, as Heather noted, designed by Ward Wellington Ward, um, who was uh, one of our most important architects here, um, at really in the region, uh, in the city and the region. He, um, uh, let's see, and he actually used this particular house um, in his own self-published work as an example of his, uh, his uh, it's a Tudor revival style uh, design house. Um, the Landmark Preservation Board, um, actually, I'm not, I'm, if I can just quickly correct something that, uh, that Heather said, it was um, the um, owner of the property prior to, uh, was considering the demolition of the property, um, and prior to that, knowing that it was on the historic properties list for the city, came and petitioned the, the Landmark Preservation Board uh, ahead of a demolition permit to determine if it would be a property that the Landmark Preservation Board would consider designating. Um, but the, the Landmark Preservation Board had held a public hearing um, and reviewed um, fairly extensive documentation about the building and about the, the house, the property, and it did find that it met um, uh, four out of the five criteria. Um, and those uh, include um, association with persons of historic significance for the city of Syracuse, which is the Ward Wellington Ward, um, association for growth and development of the city. Um, uh, in particular, here you have your the it was it was built at the time when um, the east side of Syracuse was 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 being developed. Um, it is in a pretty prominent location. There's another Ward Wellington Ward design apartment building immediately kitty corner to this, and you have the uh, Madison School on the other corner. So it's a it's a it really anchors its its own corner. Um, it's also obviously a, a work by Ward Wellington Ward um, here in the city. Um, uh, so a work of a master. Um, and then it also, the, the board also found that uh, at least one interior space was important. It still retains um, some, uh, it, uh, a um, fireplace in Inglenook with some period fixtures that the board felt were, you know, impor important to document and to, if possible, to preserve. Okay. I guess, um, yeah, I'm just... So as you said, people had applied to have it. I, I went and visited the site. I've, I've, yeah. I've walked around in it. And um, the fact that it's, you know, it has been applied for demolition, I just, it's not in the best state right now. And no. we have a developer who wants to uh, keep the tutor, you know, keep the facade, mm -hmm. but um, feels it would be too costly a project to take on if, if he has to meet all the historical criteria. This is my first time dealing with it with, it, with the historical uh, designation in, in this whole process. So I'm just trying to figure out: uh, are there any uh, is there any gray area in this? Or well, if if it if it does become a designated site, the what will happen is that the <coughs> the owner will then go through with with the with the property owner for building an addition onto the property. In fact, we've already started those discussions with the, with the property owner informally about how the building, how that, the ward house can be preserved um, and, um, and then an addition uh, constructed onto the building so that the, the property owner can <coughs> achieve his goals, uh, a number of units that he's hoping to um, to build, a and 
help achieve the Landmark Preservation board, uh, Board's goal of protecting and preserving historic resources. So we've, we've done it before. We hope to be able to do it in this case as well and um, so that he'll be able to you know, build, build the apartment building and improve the ward, ward structure um, at the same time so that we can uh, you know, maintain that historic property and, and that historic anchor will still be there. So the two parties, how far away are they right now? Um, I, I'm actually not too far away. I mean, it, we just have seen, I'm sorry, the Landmark Preservation Board has just seen in an in informal discussion some preliminary drawings and um, the design um, there was some some tweaking that needs to be that needs to happen, but it's but the, the overall comment was that they're moving in the right direction. So you do, you feel that they'll they will be able to find a compromise reach with the with the oh, property I, I, I believe so. Yes, move forward with the development. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. At least with the landmark preservation board, I believe that's true. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, um, item 28 is a special permit for a restaurant. This involves two properties. This is the corner of West Fayette and Tioga Street. And this is for, um, as I said, a uh, restaurant in the corner. So is the Stoop Kitchen, are they moving? Are they currently have their bakery or cafe within the restaurant? Are they now at the trying to basically put a separate location out there for just the bakery? Um, no, I think this is in, they need more room, and I think this is are in they, addition. Are sell a retail out of there? Are they going to retail right out of this building or sell out right out of the... Uh, uh, oh, who's that? Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, they're expanding their... Um, figured I would help you out. Uh, Norris Villain, Deputy Commissioner, Neighborhood and Business Development. Uh, they're expanding their bakery operations. Right now they're in the basement of the stoop. It's a lot of, it's tightly constrained. This would be expanding of the bakery operations so they can move that out of the downtown location, as well as some retail at the site, but no sit down. Okay. I mean, it's not far away. It's no, it's very, yeah, super great spot and a nice, <laughs> nice way on in on the west side. Grab a, grab a pastry. I don't disagree. But that's the, that's the project plan. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. You're welcome. All right. So the next one is 727 South Cross Avenue. This is uh, an expansion, actually, not an expansion, but uh, the new building up on Kraus, South Kraus, um, the old Hungry Chucks. Um, they're putting an additional restaurant in there. There is an existing one that was previously approved by the Common Council called Blaze Pizza, and this is an additional uh, restaurant in that building. And there are also retail spaces and residential units above. Uh, do we know what the restaurant is that they're putting in? Is it a chain or is it some local? Um, just, just out of curiosity, what else is it? Figure that out. <coughs> it is for. Sometimes they don't say what the name of it is, but um, they might on this application. Um, you might be able to tell from the signage. The halal guys. Mm -hmm. So I think it sounds local to me. Don't worry about it right now. It's okay. Fine. Yep. Yep. All right. Uh, item 30. Um, item 30 is a special permit for indoor amusement and recreation. And this is in the Rock, Rust, Rock West building, the big, big building on Fayette Street. And this is for um, archery, knife, and axe throwing establishment. Say what? <laughs> <laughs> I heard about no, that. It's, heard about that. It'll be a good project. Think of bowling, but with that. a... That'd be good. Think of darts, but with an axe. Uh, so. I could throw axe. That sounds like fun. We'll we'll keep that one. Jeez. Okay. And item thirty-one. And this is a special permit for a not-for-profit community center. This is the Vietnamese community center, uh, ten twenty-six North Townsend Street. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Okay. 
Who is who's organizing that? The Vietnamese Community Center. It's Tai Sha is the applicant. <laughs> Okay, and uh, items 32 through 48, um, you actually, you can save the handout. Yeah, we don't, we don't want it. <laughs> you can save it. Uh, did you want to speak on anything in particular or? I'm sure, just good afternoon, okay. counselors. Stephanie Pasquale, Commissioner of Neighborhood and Business Development. I just wanted to let you know your report is this close by end of business tomorrow. We'll have it okay. available for you. Okay, and I was gonna say anyways, I was, I'm gonna hold them because I still haven't uh, heard anything back from the land bank, so. Until I hear from her, I'm not gonna move them anyways, but I'll get your report later. Okay. Okay, so I'll hold uh, 32 through 48. Chief out. Councilor, um, Council President Hudson is gonna swear in Councilor Mike Green immediately following, so if you could just stay for a minute at the end of the study session. Yep, so we're done. Yep, yep. We're done, Octoria. Yes. All righty, and with that, I need a motion. Second. 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 All in favor? All right. We're adjourned.